Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our call to worship is from Psalm 84, verses 1, 2, and 4. It says this, How lovely are thy dwelling places, O Lord of hosts! My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. How blessed are those who dwell in thy house. They are ever praising thee. And with that passage in mind, let us stand as we sing our opening hymn together and praise the Lord, hymn number 158 in the blue hymnal. The day is surely drawing near, hymn number 158 in the blue hymnal. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. And wherefore we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake, Grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, 
in true obedience to your word, and that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us, and he has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us of all our sins. To them that believe on his name, he gives the power to become the sons of God and bestows on them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And grant this, O Lord, unto us all. seated. Our first lesson today is found on page 555 in your pew Bible. It's from 1 Kings 17 verses 1 through 7. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, <clears throat> turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You would drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. The second lesson is found on page 1779 in your pew Bibles, and it's from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 through 31. Chapter 7, in 1 Corinthians, starting with verse 29. What I mean, brothers, is that time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they had none, and those who mourn as if they did not, and those who are happy as if they were not, and those who buy something as if, were, if it were not theirs to keep, those who use the things of the world as if they are not engrossed in them. For this, is the, for this world in its present form is passing away. Here ends the lessons for this morning. The gospel reading for this morning is Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 23. It can be found on page 1504 in your pew Bibles. Again, it's Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 23. It can be found on page 1504 in your pew Bibles. I'll invite you to stand out of respect for the gospel. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 19. Reading in Jesus' name. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness. Here ends the gospel reading this morning. Praise be to thee, o Christ. Will you join with me in our confession of faith? Our confession of faith this morning is the Apostles' Creed, which can be found on page 32 in your blue hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our next hymn is hymn number 579 in the Blue Hymnal. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Hymn number 579 in the Blue Hymnal. Two months ago, my brother brought a box of my stuff from my parents' basement to me. My mom has been diligently going through the basement trying to get rid of all of this stuff that's accumulated over the years and sometimes even decades. Now this particular box had all sorts of things in, in it. For instance, name tags from Bible camp so I went to as a high schooler, or candy wrappers, high school report cards statistics from middle school sports and high school sports, 
college acceptance letters, you know, all of that important stuff that you just can't throw away in the moment because someday, 11, days la 11 years later, you're going to look back at it and you need it. Along with this stuff came the memories. And some of them made me laugh, others made me just shake my head, and most of it was thrown away. I found something peculiar, though, as I was sorting through my life. A sugar packet. Now, this sugar packet has been packed away in this box for 11 years at least. What was it that made this sugar packet so special that I couldn't find another one later on if I ever needed some sugar? Why did it need to be filed away with all of my big, important life documents? Allow, you to, allow me to give you a glimpse into my maturity as a high school student. This sugar packet was perfect. It was perfect because all it said on it was sugar, and that was it. And what you need to do with it was you just take it, you throw it on the ground, and you say, oh, you dropped your name tag and give it to someone. Yeah, there it is. So uh, now beware. Anytime someone drops a sugar packet, just run the other way. Brendan, don't use this. It's meant to be a pickup line. Uh, I don't know if it works or not. I never, I never seriously tried it, but I'd use it just for a laugh. People are like, oh, this is ridiculous. And it is. But it was apparently important enough for me to store this sugar packet in all of my life's filings away. And it wasn't just one sugar packet. No, there was like 15 or 20 of these things in this box. They all got thrown away. But pickup lines served a purpose. They're usually lighthearted comments that aren't to be taken seriously, but they can also allow you to discreetly and in a comical way share how you really feel with your crush. But it gives you a way out. If it, those feelings aren't returned, you can say, oh, it's, it's, it's just a joke. And you can walk away with your dignity still intact. These were the days before social media. And this was the day before every high school student had a cell phone. Kids have it easier these days. They don't have to worry about these kinds of lines. Our text this morning is more than a compilation of confusing and embarrassing compliments. It's more than a catalog of pickup lines as well. It wasn't Solomon's stash of sayings to seduce his wives and concubines either. It's a love poem written to woo the woman of Solomon's desire. Notice woman singular here. Written to woo Solomon's bride. Yes, Solomon had lots of other wives, but this one was different. This one stuck out above all the rest. And in the poem, Solomon conveys his excitement, his anticipation, and joy in receiving his bride. I invite you to open your Bibles up with me to Song of Solomon chapter 4, I'll be reading chapter 4 in the first verse of chapter 5. Song of Solomon 4, 1 through 5, 1. I invite you to stand out of respect for God's word if you're able. Reading in Jesus' name. How beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful you are. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats that have descended from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn ewes, which have come up from their washing all of which bear twins, and not one among them has lost her young. Your lips are like a scarlet thread, and your mouth is lovely. Your temples are like a slice of a pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with rows of stones, on which are hung a thousand shields, all the round shields of the mighty men. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, which feed among the lilies until the cool of the day, when the shadows flee away. I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you. Come with me my, from Lebanon, my bride. May you come with me from Lebanon, journey down from the summit of Amana, from the summit of Senir and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. You have made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride. You have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes, with a single strand of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils. Your lips, my bride, drip honey. Honey and milk are under your tongue, and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A rock garden locked, a spring sealed up. 
Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, henna with nard plants, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, along with all the finest spices. You are a garden spring, a well of fresh water, and streams flowing from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, and come, wind of the south. Make my garden breathe out fragrance. Let its spices be wafted abroad. May my beloved come into his garden and eat its choice fruits. I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh along with my balsam. I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. Eat, friends. Drink and imbibe deeply, O lovers. Father God, these are your words. Your word is true. Lord, we pray that as we open up your word today that you would give us understanding with these words. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to see you in this text as well. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to be here together, to be gathered as believers, and to hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I bet you when you woke up this morning, you weren't expecting to hear those words read from the pulpit. It sounds more like an Ed Sheeran song than scripture, doesn't it? Who's nervous about where this sermon is going to go this morning? Is anyone blushing yet? My goal is not to make you blush this morning. But this isn't something that you usually hear about in church. We would much rather hear a sermon on a different text because this makes us a little uncomfortable, doesn't it? Let me ask you this. Is it wrong? Is it wrong to hear a sermon from this text? My purpose in picking out this text isn't to push the envelope to see how much I can get away with before you guys all stand up and walk out on me, but to hopefully answer some confusion as to why such a steamy book as Song of Solomon made the cut for the canon of Scripture. Let's remind ourselves of a couple of things here. Song of Solomon is Scripture. So Paul includes even this passage in his statement to Timothy where he says all scripture, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So Paul recognizes, yes, even this scripture is good for us to look at. Paul's not the only one who found value in Song of Solomon. Jesus does as well. When Jesus rebuked the Jews in John chapter 5, he says to them that you search the scriptures. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It's these that testify about me. And remember how Luke ended the encounter with Jesus and his disciples on the road to Emmaus. As they're walking along and they're talking with Jesus, they don't recognize him and And they say, haven't you, where have you been? Haven't you heard of these events that have happened? And Jesus says, oh, tell me more about these events that have happened. Let me me in on these things. And afterwards, he reveals himself to them. They kick themselves. Say, how come we didn't realize who he was? And then Jesus, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. That said, there are two things that we have to recognize about the Song of Solomon. Number one, that it's inspired by God, and therefore it's profitable, it's good, it's pure, it's holy, and it's worth our time. And number two, it points us to Jesus. And so that's why we're looking at this text here this morning. You can't read through this chapter, Song of Solomon chapter 4, without getting the picture that Solomon is completely infatuated with this woman, this Shulamite woman. He is head over heels for her. He's captivated by her beauty. In the first six verses, Solomon admires her physical beauty, comparing her to the beauty that's found in nature, a flock of goats frolicking down a mountain. Freshly shorn ewes that don't have to worry about their dirty wool anymore. They're white. Coming up out of the water. A slice of pomegranate or delicate fawns. They don't really translate to our culture all that well today, do they? Brennan, if you want to try something really fun, comment to some girl you see in school. Your hair today is like a flock of goats coming down a mountain. Might be just as effective as the sugar packet. They don't translate to our culture. 
But when you put yourself into an agrarian culture, these are references that people would have understood as well as seeing. And seeing these things, seeing these sheep freshly shorn and freshly washed, you remember, oh yeah, this reminds me of this love that Solomon has for his bride, as they would have heard this poem and learned this poem. And then comes verse 7. You are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you. Solomon doesn't see a single flaw in this bride. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, they say. And Solomon, as he is beholding his bride, says, You are perfect in every way. There is no flaw or blemish in you. And in verse 8, he invites his bride to leave her land and to come and join him. To leave the land with the dens of lions and the mountains of leopards. He will provide for her. He will protect her and keep her safe. No wild beasts would be able to harass her anymore. And so he calls her to come, to join him, to live in the safety and security of his love. Verses 9 and 10, Solomon uses a word to refer to his bride that might cause us to raise an eyebrow or two. He calls her, my sister, my bride. This isn't an incestuous relationship that he's talking about. But this is a term that's used for endearment or closeness, closeness, as they are familiar with one another. They know each other deeply, just like you would know your siblings deeply. If you've ever used the term brother or sister to refer to a friend, a close friend of yours, it's similar to that. This is one who knows you deeply and intimately. Solomon makes the comment here of milk and honey are to be found under her tongue. Those were the same descriptive words that the Lord spoke to Moses when he is describing the promised land to him. This would be a land flowing with milk and honey. And here Solomon uses the same phrase, the same words, to declare that her kiss is a taste of paradise. In verse 12, he describes a rock garden locked, a garden with a rock wall surrounding it. Keep in mind, this is the time before electric fence. And for those of you who have ever tried gardening and you don't have electric fence or you don't have other ways of repelling these uh, lovely creatures who are thought, so thoughtfully come and sample your garden for you to make sure everything's okay before you get to taste your hard-earned work, they use rock, garden, or rock walls. Rock walls to keep out these critters. Rock walls to keep out these uninvited pests that would wreak havoc on this garden. This is the picture that Solomon gives here. There is only one way in, and you needed permission to enter into this garden. Solomon's lover's garden is locked. The only person that's allowed into this is the authorized person. He's saying here she is a virgin who is saving herself for her husband. And when the time is right, as a couple are married, the bride responds to all of Solomon's words and says, Awake, O north wind, and come, Wind of the south, make my garden breathe out fragrance. Let its spices be wafted abroad. May my beloved come into his garden and eat its choice fruits. She tells the wind let her, to let her husband know, I'm all yours, every part of me. Here I am. And then in chapter 5, verse 1, after that marriage is consummated, then comes these strange instructions that we read. Eat, friends. Drink and imbibe deeply, O oh lovers. Is Solomon talking to his wedding guests here? The, the marriage is consummated. He comes out to everyone who's there at the reception and says, keep on partying, everybody. Keep on celebrating. We're okay here. I don't think that's what's happening here. That seems a little, a little strange if you ask me. So who is talking and who is being addressed here? Is this someone speaking to Solomon and his bride? It seems to make the most sense that this is someone else talking to the couple as he is identifying them as friends and lovers. So who could it be? Who is the one who is addressing this newly wedded couple? The text doesn't explicitly say, but many theologians attribute these words to God blessing their union. And I like that explanation. As they come together, as they are married, the words of God, the words to this couple, enjoy your marriage. 
experience all of the joy, all of the pleasure, all of the satisfaction found in this marriage relationship. God has created it. It is good. It is pure. It is holy. It is for you. And God has ordained it. It is not shameful. It is to be celebrated. It is God's gift to be enjoyed. And it's a little glimpse of paradise. A little glimpse of paradise. So often, we take this little glimpse of paradise and it becomes paradise for us. But it's never meant to be the be-all and end-all. Say that to someone who is raging with hormones at the time. This isn't what all paradise is going to be like. It's just a glimpse. But there's so much more waiting for you in the true paradise. There is no getting around the fact that what is being described here in Song of Solomon 4 is the anticipation and the excitement and the satisfaction that is found in this sexual union in a marriage relationship. You have to go through a lot of hoops to try to explain this physical relationship away in this book. But there is more in this book than what one church confession calls a hot carnal pamphlet. That's an official confession of a church that regards this book as a hot carnal pamphlet. It's been preserved for us to show us Christ. But where do we find Jesus here in this steamy scripture? As we use other passages of scripture to interpret this passage, the answer gets to be a bit more clear. The answer is found in looking at marriage. The common passage read at weddings is Ephesians chapter 5. And there is a lot of profound marriage wisdom to be found there in that passage, beginning at verse 22. But in verse 32 of that text, Paul writes that this mystery is great, the mystery of husband and wife becoming one flesh, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. In other words, Paul is, Paul's main focus here in this text isn't how a husband and a wife come together in our one flesh. But his main focus is how Christ takes his bride and is united with his bride. It's ultimately looking at Christ, the relationship with Christ and his church. Scripture consistently speaks of God's relationship with his people as a marriage, as we are looking at in the book of Hosea, even this morning. And so as we take a step back from this passage and we use the rest of Scripture to interpret Scripture... And we can view this passage as a type of Christ pursuing his bride, the church. Looking at the book through this lens, it becomes much easier to see how it's profitable for believers today and even profitable for you. Solomon here in this passage is struck by his bride's beauty to the extent that he says, there is no blemish in you. And the same is true for Christ's bride which we've looked at in depth in the Fundamental Principles study. And I'd encourage you, if you weren't able to be here, to look at those videos on our YouTube channel. But as we look at Christ's bride, is Christ's bride dirty? Is it shameful to look at? No. But Christ's bride is not tainted. She has been cleansed by Christ herself, himself. And so she is pure. She is holy. She is spotless. She is undefiled and und. Blemished. She is just like Solomon views his bride here without any blemish. Christ's bride, again, is the church. The church, not the building, but the people, all believers. And so if you are trusting and believing in Jesus today, wherever you are, whatever your past is, then this includes you as well. As we are the bride of Christ, then that means that there is no blemish in you. Do you believe that? As we look at ourselves, we're painfully aware of our blemishes. And we're also sometimes painfully aware of the blemishes of those around us, aren't we? And we try to hide these things. We try to hide these blemishes from others so that others might not realize what we are really like in the privacy and in the, in the sinful thoughts of our own mind and our desires. Try to cover these things up. But that doesn't matter to Christ. He doesn't see our blemishes, not because love is blind and so he doesn't see it, but because he has already taken care of them, every last one of them. They have been removed from us as far as the east is from the west. 
We've been clothed with Christ's righteousness. And so in his eyes, as he sees us, as he sees you, we are that pure, spotless bride in whom there is no blemish. He has cleansed us. It's not about how we see ourselves or how we try to cover up our flaws or how successful we are in that. It's about how Christ has cleansed us and presents us holy and blameless. When Christ looks at a believer, he sees one in whom there is no blemish. He sees his own righteousness. We have been crucified with Christ, Paul writes. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives through me. Do you believe that? As we believe that, then we can begin to believe that Christ, as he sees me, as he sees you, he looks at you as that pure, spotless bride, cleansed through his word, through his blood. Next we see in the passage Solomon's invitation to his bride to leave the dangers of her home. This world is not a safe place. No matter how... (laughs) No matter how hard you try to keep your kids safe from every harm and every danger that's out there, this world is not a safe place. It hasn't been since the fall of man into sin. There are plenty of physical dangers out there. The past 18 months, we've become well aware of the havoc that a virus can make. We're well aware of the evil that was done 20 years ago on 9-11. Many people went to work that day thinking, my office is a safe place, and didn't come home. We're well aware of natural disasters, how fires can come up and consume a family and all your living, and there are plenty of more dangers that are out there in this world. There's emotional dangers, psychological dangers, and yes, spiritual dangers as well. Evil exists And Satan is still on the prowl, wreaking havoc wherever he so desires. Christ, though, continues to call us to say, come out of this land and come to me. I will protect you. I will keep you safe. Christ calls us from this world of darkness into his kingdom. He took on flesh to proclaim release to the captives, to cause the blind to see and the lame to walk. He came to seek and to save the lost. He calls us from this world of danger into his Father's hand, from which no one and no evil is able to snatch us away. He has a place prepared for us, free of tears, free of corruption, where there is no death, there is no decay, there is no wickedness, and there is no sadness or reason for sadness either. Jesus comes into this earth to say to you, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus says, come away from the dens of lions and the mountains of leopards. I will protect you. Solomon seems to be drooling with delight for his bride here. Christ similarly wants you. He wants a relationship with you. How do we know? How do we know that we are desirable to God? How do we know that we are desirable to anyone else? As we look at our own lives, we see our flaws and we're well aware of them. Or maybe we've lived our lives lonely all of our lives just waiting to be wanted by someone else. How can we know that God wants you? The author of Hebrews encourages us to run with endurance a race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. This is how we run. And then he explains who Jesus is and what he has done. He is both the author of our faith and the perfecter of our faith, but also what has Christ done? Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you realize that you are a part of that joy that was set before Christ. That you are a reason why Christ endured the cross and despised the shame. It was so that he could have a relationship with you, that you could be presented to him holy and blameless, pure, spotless, be a part of his bride. 
This is what Christ is thinking as he goes through this terrible torture. Isaiah foretold of God's delight in Christ's sacrifice, saying the joy set before Jesus was in him justifying the many. And this includes you, this love. This is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and gave himself up for us. There is no greater love than a man lay down his life for others. Do you realize that this is God's love for you? That this is Christ's love for you? This is the extent to which Jesus is willing to go to call you his bride. Jesus is taking your sin and your shame and has nailed it to the cross in his body, releasing you from your sin and uniting you to himself in his death and resurrection, being raised to new life. Christ takes pride in his bride. And as you live your lives trusting in Jesus, living your life in faith, acting in faith, doing these little things that we looked at earlier in the announcements, these things that God doesn't forget, but that God delights in. Loving God and loving your neighbors, Christ also delights in you with the same delight that Solomon has as he is waiting for his bride to come down that aisle to be united with her. Christ knows you. He knows everything about you. And he has done everything necessary to bring you into a relationship with himself. A relationship that not only lasts here on this earth, but a relationship that lasts for all eternity. And there's also this familiarity that Solomon has with his bride, referring to her as my sister. And that's another relationship realized in Christ. We've already mentioned Christ taking on flesh for the purpose of delivering us from evil, but he also takes on flesh to become our brother, to experience the same experiences that we go through. And so he was born and took on our likeness. John explains this supernatural phenomenon in this way as the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us, so that as as many as have received him, to them he gives the right to become children of of God, brothers and sisters of this word made flesh, brothers and sisters of Christ. And God invites us into this relationship where Christ is our brother. He knows what you are going through. He has gone through those experiences as well. In Romans, Paul writes that the Spirit testifies that we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. The word became flesh giving us a familial relationship. Christ is our brother. And finally comes the joy of this wedding union. For those of you who have the privilege of being married, it's a day you've looked forward to, isn't it? It's a day you don't forget. Sure, the events of that day are probably a blur, but you remember that date. August 21st, May 31st, June 18th, September 12th, you remember these days as they come. And when the calendar keeps flipping, you might forget that it arrives, but you know the day in which you were married or on which you were married. We look forward to those days, and you remember those days. Similarly, we look forward to the day when Christ takes home his bride, don't we? When Christ comes back, for his bride, bringing us finally and ultimately out of this world of sorrow, of this world of pain and death. We look forward to that marriage supper of the Lamb. Christ is making ready his bride, calling sinners to repentance and faith in him, and he is continuing to build up his church. It's full of excitement and anticipation which ought to be growing more and more and with every flip of the calendar day, knowing that the day surely is drawing near. Christ is one day closer to coming back for his bride. The last words of Christ recorded for us in Scripture are a reminder of this very fact, that yes, Christ is coming. Behold, I am coming quickly. Christ is coming quickly. Our bridegroom is coming. That wedding day is approaching. It may seem like it's forever away, but that day will one day be here. And as we believe and trust in Jesus, then we can also say, along with Solomon's bride, 
Let the winds call out to my beloved. I'm ready. I'm yours. Come, Lord Jesus. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Come, Lord Jesus. I'm ready for you to take me home. I'm ready to be yours. Finally and ultimately and fully. I would be willing to guess that this isn't the picture that came to your mind as you were just singing the song, Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. But this is a very real aspect of Christ's love for you. This intimate love that Christ has for his bride. A love for his pure, holy, unblemished bride. A love that might make us squirm because we're uncomfortable. We don't know what to do with it. But yet in a love where there is comfort and there is beauty to be seen. This is a love that Christ has for you. A love that is full of joy, excitement, pleasure, and satisfaction. A love that can be experienced whether you're married or single. Whether you're young or old. Whether you're widowed or divorced. A love that lasts forever. For all eternity. If you haven't yet experienced his love, then this is Christ wooing you with this love letter. This is Christ declaring his love for you and his desire for you. This is Christ calling you to come out of this world of sorrow and pain and extending to you the full forgiveness of all of your sins. This is Jesus pursuing you to be his bride. So I'll end with these words from chapter 5, verse 1. Eat, friends. Drink and imbibe deeply on this love on this love of God, which causes Christ to leave the comforts of heaven into our fallen humanity, take on flesh, so that he might be your brother, so that you might be his bride. Drink and imbibe deeply on this love, O oh, lovers. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word and for its truth. Lord, as we look at ourselves, we're fully aware painfully aware of our own flaws and blemishes. But God, as we look to your word, as we take your word as the truth for what it is, we realize that you don't see us as we see ourselves. You don't look at us as a man sees us, but you see us through our hearts. Lord, not the intent of our hearts, but through what you have done in our hearts and by faith that you have cleansed us through the washing of water with your word, through the finished work of Christ, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, through his blood, in order to present, to, uh, present us to yourself as a pure and spotless bride. Lord, help us to know your love for us to the extent of which you were willing to go to call us to be your bride. And God, we are so unworthy, but we are so grateful. We look forward to that day when you come back to take us to yourself or that day, Christ, when you come again to bring your bride to yourself. Father, make us ready for that day. And each day that comes, may it be just a growing excitement knowing that our bridegroom is coming. And so we pray, come Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time we'll take our offering and a reminder, a reminder, our offering for Sunday school is in the basket in the back that's going to AFLC Youth, Mission, or Youth Ministries. And here's our church offering.
Dear Heavenly Father, you invite us to call you our Father, encouraging us to believe that you truly are our Father and that we are truly your children because of the work of Christ so that we may boldly and confidently come to you in prayer, even as beloved children come to their dear Father. And so we do that here this morning. Lord, we pray that you would use these gifts that we give back to you to further your kingdom here in our midst and here among our communities, but also around the world too. Lord, we pray for all of those who are listed in our bulletins today going through various trials with their physical health. For Lauren, Donovan, Charles, Connie, Alan, Don, Delane, Dave, Janelle, Mark, Judy, Steve, Christy, for Rusty, Colby, Travis, Jolene, for John, Paul, and Sam Nash. Lord, we pray that you would be with each one of those people. You know them. You have called them by name. Lord, you love them. We pray that you would heal them according to your will, physically, but Lord, also spiritually, if they don't know you. We pray for all of those who are dealing with cancer, for all of those who are suffering with COVID as well, Lord. We pray that you would continue to heal them and draw near to them. Be with the residents of our nursing homes and assisted living, too. We pray for Edna, for Erna, and for Helen. Watch over them, Father. We pray for the families who are mourning the loss of loved ones. Be with the Kuhlman family, the Hillman family, the Fangmeyer family, too, Father. We pray that you would comfort them as they grieve, that you would draw near to them. Lord, that you would give them your comfort, a comfort through only which you can give. We pray for all of those who are with child, too, Lord. We think of Edna and Abel. We praise you for this new life. We pray that you would watch over her and protect her in this pregnancy. Lord, we pray for everyone else who is also pregnant, too. For those who are pregnant and aren't sure what to do with their children, Lord, I pray that you would put people into their lives to surround them and support them with your love and your provision. We pray for those who are suffering from miscarriages, and Lord, for those who are dealing with infertility as well, draw near to them in their pain, Father. And we thank you, we praise you for this new life, uh, for Hannah's sister's son, Wesley. Thank you for him, Lord. We pray that he would grow up to love and serve you. We pray for all of those who are serving in our military. We think of Aaron, watch over him and protect him. Lord, we thank you for all of our veterans as well who have protected us through their service. We pray, Lord, that you would provide for them. Be with all of our students here in this congregation with wherever they're going to school. Give them wisdom and insight, Lord. And we pray that you would help them to grow in their knowledge, uh, not just their academic studies, but Lord, also growing in their knowledge of you as well. Be with Jenna, Aiden, Shakira, Austin, Casey, CJ, Samuel, Brendan, Alex, and Evan, and myself as well, Lord. We pray that you would continue to help us to learn. Be with our country. We pray, Lord, that you would heal our wounds as deep as they go. Give us ears to hear one another and help us to understand where each other are coming from. Lord, we pray that you would unite this country, that we would be a united nation, one nation under God. Be with our leaders, Father. We pray that you would give them wisdom. We pray that they would lead in a way that honors and glorifies you, that they would do the job that you have placed them there to do. Be with our police. Protect them as they protect us. Be with our communities, Lord. Deliver us from all harm and danger. We pray for revival here too, Lord, that you would help us to know your tremendous love for us, that we would respond to that love as well and trust in you. Be with all of those who are affected by tragedies. Continue to provide for their needs. Father, we pray for our AFLC Youth Ministries and all of the ones working behind the scenes with that, for every volunteer youth leader, every paid youth leader, Lord, for everyone who is taking an interest in the youth of congregations, be with their work, Father, and help the youth to see your love for them through these caring adults. We pray for the persecuted church, for our brothers and sisters around the world who aren't able to worship freely. Encourage them, strengthen them in their faith. But Lord, also be with their persecutors too. Help them to see your love for them, a love that covers all sins. We pray that you'd be with our seminary interns as they are training to be pastors. Lord, craft these men to be pastors after your own heart. And we pray for VBS families too, for all of the kids who are able to be here. Lord, help them to be getting connected to local congregations and to be growing in knowledge of you and in your love. Father, be with their families too, Lord. Provide safety and security. But Lord, also draw them to yourself. And Lord, we do pray for our nominating committee here at our congregation. As we think of our annual meeting coming up, we pray that you would give them wisdom, Father. And we pray that you would provide men of your choosing for these positions. 
We pray that you'd be with AFLC Youth Ministries, with the families of teenagers around our country, around the world, that they would discuss the truths of Scripture in their own homes, and that they would be growing in God's grace together as a family. We pray, Lord, for Jason Holt and Dan Herner, and for the work that they are doing too. Encourage these men, these servants of you. And Father, we pray that you would be with us now as we pr- and hear us as we pray the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Closing hymn is hymn number 531 in the blue hymnal. Jesus loves even me. Hymn number 531 in the blue hymnal. Jesus loves me.